<clears throat> this is the National Outdoor Learning Initiative Community of Practice. We're very happy to have you all here today. I'm Nancy Strinisty, the Director of East Coast Programs, and along with my colleague Lauren McKenna, we'll be hosting the meeting today. And now I will turn it over to Lauren, who's going to introduce our presenters today. Thank you. We'd love to welcome to you today's community of practice our guest presenters, Laura Thompson and Sam Canetop from Big Green, and Michelle Newman Brooks from Chicago Public Schools. Together, they will share how they have adapted their work and relationship to each other and will cover school level programming, collaboration on grants, and policy to support garden based learning between a national nonprofit and the country's third largest school district. Thank you so much for all three of you for being here today. As introductions for each of them, Laura Thompson is the Assistant Director of Strategic Alliances for Big Green. She believes that food is, is a defining aspect of our lives, from our health to the sustainability of the environment, our connection to the land, and is how we build community, place, and culture. She's passionate about fostering food systems through education. She's worked across diverse issue areas to build partnerships and empower communities with the resources and tools they need to create change. She holds an MA in International Education and a BA in Political Science and English. And outside of work, she enjoys going on adventures in the great outdoors, yoga, and preparing delicious food. Sam Keentop, also of Big Green, is their Assistant Director of Programs. He is a lifelong Chicagoan and has worked for the last nine years with Big Green. In previous roles, he supported a network of 200 school gardens in Chicago public schools and now supports Big Green's national initiatives to support the notion that growing food changes lives. He's passionate about food, how it is grown, prepared, shared, and eaten, and brings that passion to his work and education to help others learn about our food ways with a goal to activate them in the movement for a more just and nourishing food system. And our third guest is Michelle Newman Brooks, Program Manager of School Gardens for Chicago Public Schools. Michelle serves with Chicago Public Schools and is also the owner operator of 1711 Consultants, a consulting company focused on farming, gardening, and agribusiness solutions. Her passion for environmental and food justice lends to her 15 plus years experience in nonprofit and for-profit businesses, from marketing and advertising to project management, escrow investments, finance, as well as community organizing and engagement and agriculture and horticulture. She serves as CFO of Canaan Community Redevelopment Corporation in the Inglewood community and Executive Director of Five Loaves Co-op and Farm, as well as partner, partnering with several local urban gardens and community organizations. She sits on the board for Growing Home, the Lead Abatement Resource Centers, and We Rock for Girls, and has a degree in business, agriculture, and horticulture. So without further ado, Welcome, Laura, Sam, and Michelle, and thank you so much for being with us today to share about your work, both individually with Big Green and Chicago Public Schools, and how you've collaborated to get outdoor learning and school gardening into your communities and beyond. So without further ado, welcome, Laura, Sam, and Michelle, and we'll let you take it away from here. Great. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in for us today. Um, and thank you to Green School Yards America and the National Outdoor Learning Initiative for inviting us to join today. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about Big Green, who we are, our history, and how we've evolved um, over the years. So we, Big Green, as Lauren mentioned, is a national 501c3 nonprofit, and we've been around since 2011. Um, we were founded back in 2011 to build school gardens at scale in um, urban and under-resourced schools around the country. 
Um, and the pandemic, as it did for many, many organizations around the country, really altered how we operated. Um, we weren't able to be in schools in the same way, working on the ground to support programming and maintenance of school gardens. Um, and we really developed more of a virtual model of engaging not only with educators, but also with families, which was a new audience for us in the pandemic. Um, families really became educators in their own right. And so we worked to provide resources to them to um, help kids keep growing at home, even if they only had a windowsill to grow on. Um, we have evolved now since the pandemic um, a lot as an organization, and we've recognized that our value add as an organization is supporting schools and families and communities to grow their own food through financial resources, in-kind resources, and um, programmatic support virtually. So we've really evolved from the on-the-ground work that we have been doing um, to more of a higher level support countrywide. Um, so something I, I want to touch on here in this new model as an organization, as we provide these resources, um, something that developed last fall was an opportunity called the Jumpstart Grant to get kids learning outside. Um, and that was greatly due to the Delta variant um, of COVID-19 that was prevalent this past fall. Um, we recognized that kids were just going back into school and we wanted to keep them learning at school and not needing to be um, at home again uh, that semester. So we decided to create a rapid grant opportunity um, to get kids learning outside in schools around the country. Um, this was a responsive grant opportunity that deployed $2,000 grants to schools across America in an effort to accelerate outdoor learning. Um, and in preparation for releasing this rapid grant opportunity, we talked a lot with partners of ours like Green School Yards America um, about how, how we should um, roll this out and really uh, leaning into their expertise um, in outdoor learning as we thought about the creation of this grant opportunity. Um, um, and uh, this, this grant opportunity was also really aligned to what we heard um, in terms of best practices in the field and needs related to uh, school garden success. So there is a uh, recent report called the Austin School Garden Report written by a number of different organizations and as well as uh, university partners in Austin on what makes a school garden successful. And some of those, um, those points that make a school garden successful are things like increased funding, um, increased student usage, garden training, um, those are all related to garden success. And so we worked with this Jumpstart Grant opportunity to integrate all of those elements. Um, educators were encouraged to apply through an easy application process, and then they participated in a series of webinars and online modules um, to provide resources and inspiration to bring their classrooms outside. Um, and resources were provided with, in collaboration with organizations like Green School Yards America, um, who also spoke on our webinars uh, to share the great resources from the National Outdoor Learning Initiative. Um, so I wanted to talk about this as an example of a way that we've pivoted as an organization. I think it's relevant to school districts um, on this call and, and educators on this call. Um, we learned a lot from the first round. This was our first opportunity as an organization to provide grants in this way. Um, we learned that there are barriers getting money to schools and then them being able to spend it from um, you need, needing to get vendors approved to needing to get um, certain documents signed in order to get the money um, into the bank account. We also learned about um, our timeline for application. So we, um, we released this really quickly within a matter of weeks. Um, and we learned that, you know, even though it's great to get money out as soon as possible, schools might need a little more time to be able to prepare for this type of opportunity. 
Um, we also learned that um, it's really great to offer educators opportunities to learn on their, old, their own time asynchronously. So in this first opportunity, this grant opportunity, we required a live webinar and um, we've decided moving forward, while we will have live opportunities for discussion, we also want to provide recorded opportunities for educators to watch in their own time. We also learned a lot about our systems and what's needed to make sure that a grant like this moves seamlessly through. Um, and we finally learned that we need to allow different ways to demonstrate need outside of only free and reduced lunch eligible schools. Um, there are other ways that schools might demonstrate need for um, a grant opportunity like this. Um, so just wanted to provide a little overview. We are going to be announcing um, in the coming months Jumpstart 2, so our next version of this grant opportunity based on our learnings and based on um, feedback from, from educators around the country. So um, please stay tuned for that. Lauren's going to add um, into the chat a um, email list that you can join if you and your school district and schools want to learn about any upcoming opportunities. Um, I will just quickly here move through these slides, but um, these are just some numbers that illustrate um, what we were able to achieve with the Jumpstart grant. Um, we were able to approve 92% of applications. So our goal for this was really to say yes, really to fund schools. We did not wanna turn schools away. So we were able to fund a really great number of those that applied. Um, and we were able to increase the number of kids learning outside um, a, a pretty significant amount, which was really exciting as a result of this grant. Um, and then in terms of uh, how we are evolving as an organization, um, as I mentioned, we were founded, when we were founded, we built school gardens at scale, and we had a network of school gardens in communities across the country. That is now expanding. Um, through this opportunity, you can see here, um, we, 162 of our schools that we had planted school gardens at received grants, but then also we were able to expand our reach to other schools throughout the country who weren't in that original network. So that's really exciting. We're expanding our community um, and, and folks who are aware um, of this work around the country. So with that, I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Sam. Thanks, Laura. Um, to help paint a little bit more of the picture of how Big Green as a national organization established our work within a district, um, specifically Chicago, and kind of the, a little bit more of the transition, I'm going to share a little bit of that history and um, as a way of also introducing Michelle, who will speak to the, the perspective from the district and the way that we've, we've combined our, our efforts together. So we began doing work in Chicago in 2011, sorry, in 2012. Um, and had an agreement with the city to build 100 and then 200 gardens within Chicago Public Schools. And by about 2018 had, had completed all of that work. Um, from the very beginning, our success in Chicago was really dependent on a very strong relationship with Chicago Public Schools. Initially, our collaboration was simply around application coordination and making sure that the schools who um, were the best fit within the district and supported larger district initiatives were also schools that were on Big Green's radar um, so that we could start to incorporate them and in, in, into, our, into our community of school learning gardens. Um, as our relationship evolved, um, as Big Green's programming evolved, we began to collaborate on a deeper level, thinking specifically about resources for teachers um, who were using those gardens as places for outdoor learning. Um, so we began to collaborate on coordinating workshop schedules. We um, very closely looped in their Office of Student Health and Wellness um, to support approval of and support of our curriculum, um, both a K-8 to curriculum called Ready, Set, Grow and a high school curriculum called um, Real Food Lab. And then kind of once that foundation had been built and that was, you know, looking at really years uh, three through six within our relationship through with the district and, and really continuing on today. 
Um, our focus then evolved to look at some of the more challenging aspects of work within school, school gardens and outdoor learning. So um, what does it look like to help schools sustain and maintain outdoor learning school garden programming um, within the context of just being a school and the dynamic changing environment that that is? Um, so figuring out where our direct support was needed on the ground, identifying where, what schools those were, where were requests coming in across both of our, our networks so that we could consolidate and focus our efforts where they were needed most, um, and also on resource distribution. So that kind of taps into what Laura was speaking about with Jumpstart. Um, prior to us being a granting organization, we distributed a lot of physical materials to gardens to support their ongoing success things like seeds, seedlings, soil, um, kitchen kits, cooking kits, things like that. Um, and so again, like figuring out and working directly with the district to identify those needs, coordinate and um, consolidate our efforts to be efficient and effective with the work um, has really been the, the core of our work. And as our relationship has evolved, I think the one of the keys to our success has just been the ongoing connection and communication. We have a standing monthly meeting um, that we've pretty much had on the books for 10 years straight now um, with a couple little breaks, um, you know, for accommodating transitions and, and workflow and things like that. But that, that direct connection and ongoing communication has allowed us to adapt and evolve both as Big Green has changed our work and how we do it and also as the district has shifted their approach to what does it look like as a, you know, the third largest district in the country to, to be dedicating specific resources to supporting school gardens. And um, we're really blessed to have Michelle in the role of managing that work for the district. And I will pass it over to you, Michelle, before I come back at the end and kind of tie in some of the pieces of our, our work as it's evolved today. Thanks, Sam. And I'm going to, I'm in one of my school um, locations, so we're going to hope the bell doesn't go off, but if it does, we'll figure it out. Um, but um, thank you for that um, awesome introduction. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so just thinking about how Chicago has evolved over the course of 10 years, the, the implementation of Big Green um, and the two, the push for 200 was what it was called at the time, or push for 100, push to 200, really evolved how a district the size of Chicago with 600, 650 plus um, schools, um, with, yes, we're the largest in the, the, the very largest in the country, but we're the largest in our state by 90%. So even when we talk about how we engage with our, our um, statewide school districts, it's completely different than, you know, how we would think about engaging with, with partners and so many schools. Um, and I'm a strong team of two and a half. Um, and so we really lean on our partners to go to bed. I told y'all the bill was going. Um, hopefully y'all can't hear it. If you do, just give me like a thumbs down. Um, but it really made us evaluate how um, we engage with our schools, empowering schools to be self-sufficient um, and, and champions of how agriculture looks for them. Um, so the goal is to have 100% of our schools engaging in garden-based, agriculture-based curriculum throughout the district. But at a pace and a, a goal that fits into their culture, their capacity, um, and their knowledge base, with the district being the support to add technical assistance, curriculum and programming and resources, seeds, eat what you grow training. I, the city brought me, so we didn't have a, a formalized garden team as we do now. We're nestled under the Office of Student Health and Wellness that focuses on this whole child, but the school garden team is newly formalized. Um, brought me over from the city of Chicago where I was the director of urban agriculture for the city of Chicago. So really taking that city citywide initiative of bringing agriculture um, throughout the city and now drilling down and making that opportunity possible for our students was just as important as entrepreneurs. And so realizing that the capacity was 
unmatched. We, there's no way we can do it with a team of two is that we rely on the people on the ground. Those are our teachers. Those are our partners. Those are our parents and our community-based organizations in um, making those engagements with students. You can go to the next slide. And so we then had to figure out how to tailor that, understanding that overlapping heat maps, even within our city, where those same things affect our children, where we have high obesity rates in children, um, low income, high um, rates of crime, uh, open spaces and availability of land really affect some of the very similar parts of our city. And so although my goal <laughs> and my role is to oversee a large amount of schools, we definitely drill down and tailor that and kind of phase that opportunity throughout the need of our entire city. So if you look here, you can see like our higher rates are in red. Um, and those are usually areas of low and limited access, um, also uh, communities of color um, and high rates of poverty. And then we spread it out from there. So even though we provide equal, um, equal resources is not equitably distributed throughout the community, right? It's heavier on the areas that are most need and lighter on the areas that are of less need. Um, you can go to the next slide. My, um, and then, so we really value that in these ways here, um, where we partner with other organizations, including Big Green, which is our largest partner, um, and really, I think, helps, can honestly say, help shape how we address garden-based agriculture for our district, as well as the 20 other partners that um, we bring on as collaborators with our farming school program through our food and nutrition, um, all the way down to um, pullouts of which we don't have the capacity in the district to pull out. Oh, there's the Calvary. Um, and so just doing student pullouts is not our uh, in our ability, but we do have partners that do that. And so we really, again, circling back to what I said at the beginning, is we really lean heavily on our school-based partners and our community partners and our individual school partners and in the capacity that fits the school. So we meet the school where they are, and then we assist at that point. So I'm turning back over to Sam to kind of wrap it all up. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so yeah, to kind of put a, a, a little bit more of a fine point on it, the, it's, it's good to be clear that Big Green used to really provide that on the ground support in our schools. Um, you know, we were the ones who were at, this is a picture from Black Elementary um, in, in Chicago Public Schools. We were at the school to help plant this bed of spinach and arugula. Um, and then the teachers and the students cared for the garden and followed up with photos. And, you know, we were, the, we were that link to make that happen. Our organization has had such a dramatic shift this past year, and we're not providing that direct support to our schools anymore. We're really shifting our focus as um, an organization to be looking at a national level of what our What's the knowledge? What's the experience? What are the resources that we've been able to build over these past 10 years doing that work that we can now shift um, the lens and the platform that we're sharing that with rather than on an individual school by school basis, but onto a national level. And so grants are a big piece of that just to provide the, the capital, the financial capital so that schools have some flexibility and resources to be able to apply those dollars in the ways that make sense for them to sustain their work on the ground. Um, another piece of that is the training that we support to go to go with those dollars so that um, instead of going to every individual school and meeting with their staff and presenting to them, here's the resources that Big Green has to offer you. Um, instead of meeting with a principal one-on-one, -on -one, we're um, providing the that same content that we would um, build those agendas on and, and build that, that set of suite of resources around as, um, as learning tools, as, as, um, as modules that are existing on our learning management system. Um, and again, thinking about what other partners are doing this work that we're inviting to present and, and share that information um, at a much broader scale. That, that is allowing us to continue to do this work and find this impact in a way that isn't limited to the 200 schools in CPS where we've built gardens or the 150 schools in Memphis, but looking at the larger network across the country, um, how can these resources be of value and made available to so many more schools where we know this work is happening, 
already and a little bit extra is needed to sustain it or the schools that are just dipping their toe in the water and starting to do this work for themselves and need a, a good clear beginning point and suite of resources to take those first steps. Um, and so a good example of how that's working is the, the transition that we've been working through in Chicago, working directly with Michelle to help to identify, okay, we're no longer providing these resources. Who within CPS and the partner network there is able to help fill in some of those gaps? And how can Big Green, with the resources we can provide, contribute to that suite of resources, that suite of partners that are then kind of providing all those layers of support across the district? We're taking the learning from that along with the other regions that we're supporting and looking at new districts. So we've been recently meeting with Austin and trying to figure out and present these ideas that we've learned from other regions to the community of folks who are doing this work already in Austin. And so the first several months of those conversations were really just learning and understanding who is doing what, what is needed, what are the resources, what are the assets, what are the, the needs. Um, that are being kind of addressed in that own community, and then how do we how do we fit the resources that we have into that? As again, it's just another partner within that suite of resources that are combining to really create sustainable, ongoing, meaningful art, outdoor and garden based um, learning opportunities at those schools. Um, so we're very much looking forward to continuing to learn about how that works, what it looks like. Um, how it needs to be adapted for different schools in different districts. Um, and as Laura said, we're going to be continuing to roll out these opportunities. So if you do have an opportunity to sign up for the mailing list and find out when these new opportunities are going to be released, please do. Um, and our learning management system is going to be evolving over the next year as well. And so if you see maybe some opportunities to partner, um, share resources, tell stories using that kind of a platform, um, we also would invite those those conversations as well. So thank you all so much for um, inviting us to participate today. Um, we'll leave with the final slide just to share our contact information. Again, we invite you all to to reach out as opportunities might um, might present themselves. And, and yeah, thanks again for all the work you do. Thanks, Michelle, for joining us, um, and thanks, Laura, for for setting up and coordinating. Thank you all. Thank you, Sam, Laura, Michelle. Um, so little round of applause, not only for sharing um, and taking the time to be with us today, but for the ongoing support that you've been giving your school communities all of this time, both before the pandemic and after. Because um, what, what makes your community stronger makes all of us better and stronger. So thank you for your example. Any questions, feel free to drop in the chat. Um, Nancy, are, are there any questions that um, are coming up for you? Um, and then people were asking about data, about the use of the gardens as opposed to the access to the gardens. And we shared a link to the Austin School Garden Report that has some data about that. But I don't know if any of you would like to add anything to that. I, I can share just from my perspective. I used to, in my previous role at Big Green, I was the program manager for Chicago. So um, was really thinking about what that network looked like, how it was actively being used. And I will say, we do have some data that's old, um, looking at kind of our, some evaluations that we did around some of our curricular content back well before the pandemic. And so I don't, I don't think that data would really be relevant and useful today, but pretty consistently from 2012 when we first started building gardens and started to understand how they were being used um, really looking like once we started to establish specific programming that was able to be um, there were clear expectations from our school partners about what we were able to provide and how that worked once we were able to establish those relationships we had um, a system where we Kind of tiered our schools in kind of their area their levels of engagement within the school garden space and almost no matter what we did with our kind of evolving program model there was always about 30 percent somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of our schools um, 
10% were always in this category and then 20% or so, so would fluctuate every year um, of schools that just without big green direct support being there with their schools, with their teachers, with their students in the garden, the gardens really wouldn't be active. Like it really required our, our active ongoing support to make sure that those gardens were actively being used. Um, the rest that 70 to 85, 70 to 80% of schools um, were really able to sustain ongoing programming every year, just with a range of like some with absolutely no support from Big Green. It's just like, we're here, the, we helped to build the garden, we helped to establish um, what was going to be happening there. Maybe that was about 30% of our schools and they just really owned it and, and drove the work there. And then the other kind of 30-ish, 40% of schools had some direct engagement with Big Green, but um, really were able to, with a little bit of handholding, um, maintain ongoing active use of their garden. So that's a long-winded kind of answer, but it, I think it gets at something that we consistently saw year to year um, mm -hmm. over the course of about 10 years. Thank you. There are quite a few more questions in the chat. Um, Mariana asks, do you have examples of obstacles that schools found when trying to use the rapid grants? Laura, you answered all of those questions on the email. You probably have the best answer for that. <laughs> and I can answer from the yeah. district side. Yeah, go ahead, Michelle. Go ahead. Um, so just from the district side, the way Chicago mm -hmm. operates our budgets with schools individually, um, that was probably the biggest, and we had that in one of our uh, meetings, was that schools struggled to be able to actually use the funds because the way funds filter through our district is uh, uh, to the schools is through the district first. Um, and so um, with phase two of that, we're kind of revamping how um, the schools will be able to accept those funds because it really um, bumps into their overall school budget. Um, and can sometimes, um, additional funds can sometimes lessen budget lines er elsewhere. And so um, what we've come, the solution we've come up with, and we'll just have to put into practice this round too, is that I will accept, I as in my, my, um, my department uh, will accept the funds on behalf of the schools and then it will be distributed to the schools based on instructions from Big Green. So whatever funds have been awarded to that school, I'll receive those instructions and it'll be an easier transfer to them. I know Laura, sometimes it was just being able to cash the check. Um, whereas accepting one check at, on the district level and then making simple um, fund transfers into the schools seems like it's gonna be a more seamless way of getting it to the schools. Um, and then even uh, thinking about sometimes dollars not being the answer, but in kind um, being a different answer because of um, our procurement policy around how schools can purchase items. Um, again, Chicago is not the easiest in, in, in the policy surrounding how um, we operate in our district. So we're trying to make the path as, as seamless as possible, um, but without full district control, control. I really do not want to, nor do I have the capacity to control schools on the school level. And so however we can make that as easy as possible by analyzing, like I would, I'm just gonna say this trial run of, 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 of the first one and then just finding out where those areas of, um, of, of problems were and mitigating them as we come, come about. Um. Melissa asks, do you work with partners who are out of school time, grass work, grassroots community projects, et cetera? Um, yeah, we don't limit. So the only thing we, uh, we ask is that schools really um, navigate their partners on a school by school basis. There are schools that only engage with partners in their local community, like Inglewood works with In Imagine Inglewood If. And so since Imagine Inglewood If, okay, Bert, um, if Imagine Inglewood If is only focused on schools in their neighborhood, then our assistance from the district level is connecting them with schools in that Inglewood community that they may have issues or not issues, but trouble just reaching out to. And so some of that district mitigation is um, important to our national partners like Big Green, Gardeners, so our other schools are just looking for a number and just would look for um, 
for assistance on pinpointing the best schools or the schools that are, because some of our schools have so, like we have, some schools have like four partners in the same school. Um, and so it's like, we really want to spread, spread the love a little bit and not always have the same schools getting the same resources when there are other schools that could benefit from very, especially if that school's been receiving those same resources for years and would probably do just fine on their own and then re-engaging those partners with others, whether it be summertime, out of school time, um, well, summertime is out of school time, but after school time, summertime, um, and during school, time. We do not limit that. We just want to make sure that those partnerships are viable and sustainable. Um, and then the last question is from Stephanie. Is there any research showing the minimum number of school of garden experiences per child per year to have an impact on health or education outcomes? Interesting. Go ahead, Sam. Well, no, I, I can't. I was just going to say, I know that there is. I know that that's research that we've um, looked at both at Big Green and I know the district has in the past also in establishing how we how we survey schools about like what the threshold of usage in the garden is. I just don't have the like, you know, the I can't think of the exact research documents, right, you know, reports right now that I don't know if either of you or probably somebody else on the call is. I don't know. I know for our district specifically, we do a healthy school survey every year. Um, and it's all it's from our whole child perspective. So everything from food and nutrition to um, physical education, sexual education, and including um, garden based um, curriculum. We send that out to our entire district, but then we require it from certain um, networks so we'll kind of rotate through the networks on which ones are required just so we have a baseline to start at and then everything else kind of filters in and so we um, use that um, survey um, which is called our healthy school survey to gauge um, engagement from the school it's as a whole and then um, based on because not all schools use the garden in the same way some are uh, um, uh, curriculum based like the science department uses it or the culinary department for high schools culinary uses it and then for some of our elementary schools and we have a couple of middle school schools in our district it might be just grade based like the pr primary or middle schools or just one grade uses it and so it's really hard to gauge a school-wide engagement with a garden if only a small portion of the school engages with it and so that's why we really send out personalized surveys to each school and then we kind of make a a average estimate based on like we'll group those schools together like schools that only engage because of a cu curriculum or ones that engage with just a classroom and we'll group those and then we'll average it out from there Do we have a second there's a really great question tara posed in the chat about um about district admin but teachers are feeling frustrated that school administrators aren't supportive of their own interests in outdoor ed. Um, I, I don't know that we have time. That's a, that, could, that opens up a really big can of worms, um, but it, it's a topic that, you know, I have some, some things to say about and I'd be happy to address quickly now or we can save that for breakout or schedule a follow-up conversation. Yeah, we, you can take a, um, a couple minutes, sure. Cool, so one thing that, stood out looking at that University of Texas um, Austin School Garden Report. They specifically researched what were the perspectives of educators, of classroom teachers, when it came to sustainable garden programs at their schools, and what were the perspective of administrators of the, the keys to successful sustainable school garden programming. And teachers said one of the biggest barriers to their garden programming was administrator support. And principals said one of the biggest barriers for, the, for them to support outdoor learning was teacher support and buy-in. Um, so that, that to me actually, I think that's really heavy that, and says a lot about the different perspectives that there are from a classroom educator and a principal. Um, if there's one or two educators within a school that are really excited about it and they don't have the support of a principal because the principal isn't seeing widespread support for that amongst the school and their priorities are elsewhere. 
um, that's gonna be a barrier for school-wide implementation, right? Um, the other thing that I've seen and that I think is really important is every school has goals, has established written clear goals about what they wanna work towards and achieve, right? Like in Chicago, it's the continuing improvement work plan. And you know, like there's all of the things that we at schools create to support the continued growth and development of our schools. Whenever we see schools that as, as a community, parents, teachers, principals have identified the school garden as a tool to achieve broader goals, whether that's addressing the whole child, increasing parent engagement, could be specifically around like academic achievement, like when those are tied to the school garden and that's included in the conversations and written into those plans, those are I think when we see the most powerful school-wide adaptations of garden programming. But I think that has to be a, a universal vision of a school community that from my perspective requires an initiation from somebody and a principal, a school administrator, a district is a powerful initiator of that conversation. Um, but then there also has to be the support at the teacher and parent level so that they have the support that they need to implement it. Because a vision without that support, um, I don't think will go anywhere. So it, it, that's, a, that's a really great question. And I think it, at the center of kind of what we should be thinking about as districts and school leaders, about how do we identify these opportunities and then build support around them. And I don't think that's also a quick fix. I think that's, uh, you know, shifting cultures within any community is something that's a long, slow um, process that requires commitment and dedication and a team of people working together. And not to brag on my district and a quick little one-liner, um, but it has helped. That is, an is an initiative coming from our district. And so the fact that a whole team has been, even though we small team, I'm advocating for the growth of our team is because this team was started because of the goal that um, garden-based agriculture, I mean, garden-based programming and the introduction of agriculture in a context that is like unheard of in a city, like a metropolis like Chicago, like you can't even go five miles and, and run into open farmland yet. And so we had to be purposeful in introducing agriculture into our community context or our city's context. And so that was an initiative that really was passed. I mean, it came from the community and the desire of the teachers and students and parents, but it was heard. And then it was there was policy and initiative wrapped around it. So we don't have those issues, um, fortunately, and I'm not bragging on my city, but I am, is that we don't have those issues that there's no administrative of support. Either you support or you support. Those are the two options you have here in Chicago. And so how from the district can we support schools to bring that about in a way that capacity is important for me uh, as the leader of this initiative. And so I want to make sure that schools have the capacity and realize what it takes. It's just not sexy and it's just not beautiful. It's hard work. And so how do we then incorporate that hard work and that education into this initiative? Wow, thank you so much. Boy, something for us to strive for. That was very inspiring. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, I, we wish we could <laughs> give you the floor for another couple hours. <laughs> um, thank you so much for your sharing, Laura, Sam, and Michelle. Um, and not only for taking the time to be with us here today and share with the community of practice, really insightful and inspiring information about your own experience, but for all the work and support that you've given your own school communities, both during the pandemic and well before and well after.